so today the topic of our lecture is tokenization. So we're going to be talking about how, given an input sequence, you split the sequence into tokens. Um, up until now, we've been assuming that the input sequence will be split into words. Um, but as you'll see, modern language models don't actually segment their input into words. They segment it into subwords or even smaller units. So before we get started, uh, a couple of you asked about the midterm date. We are tentatively thinking around the end of the month, maybe March 30th. Uh, it could be later than that, but definitely no earlier than that. Um, so if you need to like mentally prepare yourself, you can yeah, you know, think about the end of the month. There are already practice midterms available in Piazza. Um, we will put last year's midterm, sorry, last semester's midterm on Piazza as well, uh, so that you can you can check that out. Um, and the week of the midterm, we'll basically have one review session, and then class will be canceled for. So this is an in, sorry, a take home midterm. So you get two days to do it. It's completely open book and open internet and everything like that. Obviously, you have to do your own work, um, so make sure you do that. Uh, we sadly did catch some people copying each other's answers um, last time. But uh, other than that, anything is fair game. The questions, as a result, are supposed to be kind of challenging and not easily solvable from Googling the um, topic of the question. Um, and there will be more details about this uh, that uh, I will provide closer to the, the date. All right, so homework one, probably going to be released tomorrow. It's, it's basically done, but just needs a couple um, questions to be touched up. Quiz two was released. It's due on Monday. And your project feedback, you can expect that next week. All right, any questions about any of this? Okay, um, so before we get into the topic of the class, which is tokenization, I know last class we kind of rushed through the um, sampling-based decoding algorithms, so I wanted to just go over the last one, top P sampling, um, to make sure that it's clear what is going on. So I have the paper. This was assigned as reading, so um, you should definitely read this and understand the uh, algorithm, but it's quite simple. So um, basically, the insight in this paper is that there are some occasions where when you're trying to predict the next word, the distribution is quite flat, which means that there's a lot of potential options that are plausible in this given this prefix. So for example, she said, comma, quotation mark, I never. If this is your prefix, then the next word could be, you know, thought or knew or had or saw or blah, blah, blah. All of these words, these verbs are kind of plausible given this prefix, right? On the other hand, if you look at this peaked distribution, I ate the pizza while it was still. Uh, there's only a few words here that, that make sense given this, this uh, context, right? So hot, cooling, I wouldn't even say is a, um, I mean, maybe if you like, cold pizza or something, warm on heating, but like as you get uh, down into the less likely candidates here, um, soon there, there really aren't many that are uh, plausible given the setup. So like this one here, the flat distribution, there's a lot more choices of viable words than um, this peak distribution. So Let's just look at these distributions and use them to review the decoding algorithms from, from last time. So if I were doing greedy decoding, given this flat distribution, how would I generate the next word? What would I do? Right, so what word would that be? Thought, right? So in greedy decoding, I will take the argmax of this distribution, which is thought, and I would just always produce that. So Every time I saw this prefix and I got this distribution, I would always pick the word thought, right? Um, so we talked about beam search as a way to consider some of the 
like the top two or top three most probable uh, words and also keep multiple hypotheses present. But then we switched over to these sampling based methods. So the first thing we talked about was pure sampling. That means this distribution contains the, is of the size of the entire vocabulary. I have potentially 100,000 different choices. Each of these choices has some probability mass. I'm going to randomly sample from this distribution using these, uh, the probabilities of each word to, as a weight, um, essentially. So there's some chance that I could predict thought using peer sampling. But if I run it again, I could sample the word meant. If I run it again, I could sample like a random word like zebra, right? There is always some probability with which I'll choose this word. So peer sampling we generally don't use because the tail of the distribution here does have some significant probability mass, even if each of the individual words that make up the tail have a very small uh, probability associated with them. So that's the problem with peer sampling. And then we talk, talk about top K sampling, where instead of sampling from the entire um, distribution, I'm going to look at the top K most probable words. So let's say I uh, selected a K of 10. So here I would consider thought, knew, had, saw, did, said, wanted, told, liked, and got. And I would just throw away all of the other words in the distribution. So now I only have 10 choices. I can rescale these probabilities and then sample from this new distribution that has only 10 words. So this is top K sampling. The idea is that now the tail of the distribution does not ever get predicted in the setting. So a low probability word will likely not get predicted in the setting. And I still will get some diversity in my output. So every time I run top K sampling in the setup I just described, I might pick one of these 10 words with some probability. Right? So top K sampling generally good for improving the diversity while maintaining the grammaticality and general quality of the output text. However, if we look at the peak distribution, we can kind of see the problem with having a fixed value of K. So here, if I use K equals 10, I'm going to get hot, cooling, warm, on, heating, but then also consider these five other words which have a very low probability under the language model, may not be relevant at all. Um, similarly, if you look at the top K of 10 in the flat distribution, we're not considering many words that might be very reasonable within this context. They just didn't happen to make the threshold of 10. So because there are situations where the distribution shape changes, sometimes it's flat, sometimes it's peaked, the final sampling algorithm that we talked about was called top P sampling, um, which is introduced by this paper, or nucleus sampling, where you choose your threshold of how many words to consider based on the cumulative probability mass and not on some fixed number of words. So instead of setting a threshold of 10, I might say, I want to consider as many words as it takes to get up to 95% of the probability mass, or 90%, or something like that. Um, and so in this case, that might, be, that might mean that I only consider hot and cooling and no other words. In this case, that might mean I consider, I don't know, because these are all 0.08, I might consider 40 words, right? So it just is determined by the total probability assigned to the, the head of the distribution. Um, so top P sampling, although still it seems like kind of a hack, it is um, in, in cases where you want to maximize diversity while maintaining your output quality to some extent and the relevance to the prefix, top P sampling is usually preferred over any of the other options. If you're doing something where like the accuracy or faithfulness of the output is much more important than diversity, so something like machine translation, then beam search is the preferred output. People rarely will use greedy search um, and will very ra rarely use uh, greedy, uh, sorry, uh, full pure sampling from the entire distribution. All right, any questions about decoding? Any YouTube questions? No. 
Okay, so with that, let's uh, get to the topic of the lecture today, which is tokenization. So the question is, how do we represent an input text? Not talking about vectors or anything like that, but how do we segment our input text before we even feed it into one of these neural networks? So let's take our example from um, that we've been using through the semester. Students open their books. The way that we have talked about this up till this point is that we will just tokenize each word. So I have four different words in this input. Each of these is a word type in my vocabulary and gets assigned some index. It gets its own uh, word embedding. And then the sequence of four embeddings is my input to the neural network, right? So it might be something like this, where I have students as ID 11 of my vocabulary opened is associated with this ID of 298 and so on. All of these allow you to look up the corresponding word embedding for this word in some big matrix um, uh, that contains all of the, the word embeddings. So one um, thing that is required then is a way to segment an input uh, text into words, right? So a tool that does this is called a tokenizer. And in this case, we need a tokenizer that tokenizes on word boundaries. So in your very first homework, uh, homework zero, I guess you've only had one so far, uh, in your only homework, um, we ask you to count up like how many words are in some input text. And we told you to do, to do white space tokenization. So here, you just split the string on white space and those are the resulting words. Of course, this is not a great way to go. Um, so for example, uh, if I have this sentence, Mr. O'Neill thinks that the boys' stories about San Francisco aren't amusing. I probably want O'Neill to remain as one word, but for aren't, I might actually want to split this into R and then the uh, N apostrophe T, right? Because these, um, and you know, how do I deal with things like hyphens? How do I deal with punctuation, amusing period? probably want to split those. So in the end, there are many, many possible edge cases when you're building a word tokenizer. They require a lot of rules that um, are basically manually constructed, regular expressions, how to handle particular inputs. Uh, Spacey is a widely used library that contains many different tokenizer uh, approaches. There are trained models, there are rule-based approaches. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, in getting word tokenizers, you can check out this library. Um, okay, so if we are using word-based tokenization, then one really important thing is how do we handle an unknown word? So remember, our uh, vocabulary is defined by our training data, right? All of the words that we see in our training data, but our test data might have words that never appear in our training data. So if we train a model with, say, 30,000 word embeddings, and then uh, at test time I see a word that I don't have an embedding for, how do I handle this, right? So we don't even have a way of getting an embedding for an unseen word if we're using this approach. Um, so a common solution here, if you're doing word level tokenization, is to take all of the low frequency words in your training data set. Uh, so you can define you know, all words that occur less than x times, right? Or something like this. You can replace all of those tokens with a single unknown token. So this onc token. Um, so all of these rare words now become onc. And onc is a symbol in your vocabulary. So at test time, if you see a word that isn't in your vocabulary, you can just replace it with this onc token. And now you have an embedding associated with that. So hopefully the model learns how to process this. Um, so a question then, why do we have to use these onc tokens during training time? Because uh, we've observed everything at training time, right? There's nothing out of our vocabulary. Why might we want to use an onc token at training time?
Exactly. So if we only use the onc token at test time, the model doesn't have any idea how to deal with this token, right? Because it's never seen it during its training process before. So that's why we want the model to learn how to represent the unknown words and how to handle them in different syntactic constructions and so on. That can only happen if we also show the onc token during training time to the model. All right. Um, what are some issues with this, though? I mean, it, great, we have a way to represent anything in, that we see at test time, but are there some issues with, with doing this? There is only one token, and you're looking at other words, you just need to one. Yeah, uh, th exactly. So we are collapsing all of these different possible, like an un unknown token could be a name of a person, it could be some verb form that was never observed or was rare, it could be critical to understanding some document, right? Like maybe there are multiple entities that are all new, the model hasn't seen them during training, and you're replacing all of them with an onc token. You don't even know which onc token is uh, interacting with which, right? It could be very confusing. So yeah, I mean, this is the, the main drawback, right? You're collapsing a lot of information into a single token, and you're losing a lot of information, especially when you have multiple unknown tokens. All right, um, so here's an example. Um, this, I think, is from Wikipedia about some chapel, uh, and it's got this uh, Welsh word name. And uh, you can see what happens w at uh, test time with, uh, with a model that's using some training vocabulary. Uh, hen, onk, onk, hen being the Welsh word for old and onk meaning chapel. You don't even know which onk this is referring to or what this onk even is. So it's very confusing even for a human, right, to make sense of, of something like this. So, um, right, there are other limitations of these word level tokenization schemes. Um, different forms of a word, for instance, like a verb, they each are associated with separate word types in the vocabulary. They have separate embeddings. So open, opened, opens, opening. All of these words are treated independently of each other given a uh, word level tokenization. But you might want to have you know, one word embedding for the stem of the verb and then one for each possible suffix. Those could be shared across you know, all different types of verbs. Um, so this kind of forms the intuition of the next couple approaches that we will discuss. Um, so first, let's answer this question in the yellow. Why is treating different forms of the same word problematic, especially for uh, smaller data sets? Any ideas? Anyone other than you two? All right, go for it. Exactly, right? So if you have four different vectors for each of these forms, you have to relearn the meaning of open, the stem of this verb, for every single one of these forms. So maybe you only observe opening three times in your training data, but you observe open 50 times, right? It would be really nice if you could share information uh, between both of these words if they somehow shared the same embedding, that would be really great. But in this setup, you can't do that. Okay, so um, let's look at uh, one alternative to word level tokenization, which doesn't have any of these issues, the character level tokenization. So here you have, um, I mean, depending on what you consider a character, uh, potentially a small vocabulary, right? You could imagine in English, Maybe we just have 26 letters and some digits. Uh, of course, we're ignoring Unicode characters for now. We'll, we'll talk about those uh, later on. Um, but certainly a smaller vocabulary than uh, the number of words that you might have. Um, so here, do you have the unknown sequence, uh, the unknown word problem? No, right? Because any unknown word can be represented as, can be broken down into characters, and then we can represent that word. Even if we've never seen that word before in training time, 
we still have a way of representing it as uh, characters, which we've seen many, many different times. Um, the problem with this is that a single word like opening, right, we would just have one embedding associated with opening if we're using word level tokenization. With a character level tokenization, now we represent this with a sequence of seven character uh, embeddings, like O, P, E, N, I, N, G. Um, so you can see that on average, if you use character tokenization, the length of your input sequence is going to be a lot longer than if you used word level tokenization. So why might that be an issue for any of the models that we've discussed up till this point? That's right. So if you're talking about the transformer language model, right? It computes self-attention, which means every single token in the input is compared to every other token in the input, right? And so if you're doing it this way, the self-attention's complexity grows quadratically with the input sequence length. And if you have a huge sequence of characters, it's going to be very, very slow to process or compute all the self-attentions at every layer. So this is a big limitation of these character level models. So, okay, there is a middle ground between word and character, um, which we call subword level tokenization. So this was developed in 2016 for machine translation. Um, and the motivation is that, you know, we have parts of words that occur over and over again, like suffixes and so on. But we also have stems of words, which we might want to preserve as separate embeddings. And there's no reason to encode these frequently occurring words as sequences of characters that'll just make our sequences very long. There's probably some middle ground that we can achieve here. Um, so if you want to do this then, one problem is how do you define your vocabulary? How do you come up with these pieces of words that you can include in your vocabulary? Um, and the algorithm that was proposed here is just using a very simple algorithm called byte pair encoding to um, encode, uh, to, to come up with the vocabulary. So we're going to go over um, how this algorithm works in detail. It's, it's very, very simple. Um, this is actually an example from the Hugging Face Tokenizers um, library. And so here we have five different words, hug, pug, pun, bun, and hugs. And each of these words in our training data set occurs some number of times, which is uh, in this column. So when you're applying byte pair encoding, the very first thing you do is form a base vocabulary that consists of all of the characters in your training data set. So here we, in our very simple toy example, we have seven different characters, B, G, H, N, P, S, U. Um, so we're going to start our vocabulary with this. If we didn't do anything else, then we would just have a character level tokenizer. Our sequences would be super long. We want to do better than that. So once we have formed our base vocabulary, we're going to tokenize our data, which means that hug becomes H-U-G, a sequence of three characters. Hugs becomes H-U-G-S, the sequence of four characters. So on the left here, we tokenize our data using our current vocabulary. And now we're going to count up the frequency of each pair of characters in this tokenized input. So let's take a look at HU, this uh, pair of characters. So HU occurs 10 times in the word hug. It does not occur in pug, does not occur in pun or bun, and it occurs five more times in hugs. So the total count of HU, this pair, is 15. If you do this for all possible character pairs or token pairs in this, uh, this data set, you're, you'll find that UG here occurs 20 times. So it occurs 10 times in hug, 5 times in pug, and 5 times in hugs. So what you're going to do now that you've tokenized your data and counted up these character pairs is you're going to choose the pair that occurs the most frequently, and you're going to make a new symbol 
that is UG and add it to your vocabulary. So we took UG and we merged those two characters into one new symbol, that's UG. And now our vocabulary consists of all of the letters from before and this new symbol UG. So now every time we see UG together, we're going to use this new symbol. We're not going to use U and then G. So we're saving on um, our sequence length by using this new symbol, right? So now we're going to retokenize the data with our new um, symbol added into it. So now you see that hug is no longer a sequence of three tokens. It's a sequence of two tokens, H plus UG. Pug is also a P plus UG. Pun is unchanged. It's still three uh, characters. We haven't added anything to deal with pun. So now if we count up the character pairs again, you see that UN is the most frequent um, in this new tokenized data. And another pair that's quite frequent is H plus UG. So you can see how you can get longer and longer words formed through this method. Um, because if we merge these two tokens together, now we have a three token symbol. Um, so if we merge these two tokens together, H, U, G, those characters are all in our vocabulary. U, G is in our vocabulary. And then also H, U, G is in, your, in our vocabulary. So we have all of these different forms. Um, some are longer, some are shorter. In this case, we're going to choose U, N to merge. We're going to add it to our vocabulary. We do this process again. We probably find that H plus UG is the next most frequent. We add that to our vocabulary, do this again. And we're going to repeat this for a specific number of merge steps, which is like kind of a hyperparameter that you decide. Um, and then it, that allows you to control the size of your vocabulary as well, because at every merge step, you're going to add one more um, word type to your vocabulary. Uh, okay, so is this clear? Any questions? This is an extremely simple um, algorithm. So I guess your question is, why instead of doing this, don't we use some uh, predefined knowledge of like syllables or something like that to construct the vocabulary? You could certainly do that. However, like that knowledge might not exist for all domains. It might not exist for all languages. Even in like normal English, I think it's going to be very difficult to identify all the syllables or or like uh, parts of words, stems, and suffixes that you might want. Um, and this approach is data based. So. At least you know that the, the symbols that you're adding have some specific, spec, uh, specified frequency, right? They occur frequently enough that it's worthwhile to create a new token for them. Um, so those are some reasons. So the question is, if we use this kind of tokenization, and we start generating text or something like that, how can we ensure that the output is real words or grammatical or whatever? You can't. Um, so many times uh, when you're decoding from models that are at the subword level, you will form like weird new words, especially with models that are not trained on a lot of data and are kind of small. Um, this also happens with character level models, right? Because you can just generate any character at any time. Um, and, you know, it kind of also happens with word level models. Like, you can generate a word that makes no sense within the context. So uh, all of these models are capable of, like, going off the rails and generating stuff that doesn't make sense. Uh, it's just a matter of is your model trained on enough data? Is it powerful enough to encode like linguistic information from that data? And do you have a good decoding algorithm from your model? So these are the two factors. You just care about the... Yeah. All right, other questions? Okay, so right, we keep rep repeating this process for a specified number of merge steps. 
and then we stop. So if we stopped after, say, like three merge steps, we would have this vocabulary of our, all of our characters, UG, UN, and hug. And now, like you can see, we've actually cut down a lot on the sequence length of, this, of all the words in this uh, training data set. So hug is its own word type. Pug is represented by the letter P and then UG. So you can draw an anal analogy from this to something like opened, right? So you might have open plus uh, ed, open plus ing, open plus s, right? All of these are possible in two symbols now with a, a method like this. Um, that said, the algorithm that I've described doesn't consider like suffixes or anything as special boundaries. So if opens and opened and opening all occur frequently enough in the data set, the algorithm might decide that all of those are worthy of having a separate word type in the vocabulary. So um, although you can like intuitively say that you know this method gives you subwords as well as characters and words, uh, in practice it's hard to say that it will always give you like a stem and suffixes for a particular verb. You can't guarantee that because it's not using any sort of linguistic information in the, um, the merge process, right? It's strictly going off these counts. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, is traditional stemming ever used? Because there, there are models that are called stemmers, which will just remove the suffix or prefix or whatever and make uh, all forms of the word the same. Uh, these are generally rule-based stemmers. Um, and they, they, people did try them when these models were initially being developed, uh, especially for when we were using word embeddings. Um, it was actually good to share information across all of the different forms of a word. Nowadays, no one uses those for uh, like neural language modeling. They're still useful for other NLP applications like topic modeling, but um, we're not going to talk about those here. In general, for like language models, no one is is using stemmers. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good question. I mean. Uh, a lot of it is uh, related to, at least initially when it was first developed, was related to how big you wanted your vocabulary to be. Um, because this, for every entry in your vocabulary, you need to have a word embedding, right? And then all of your word embeddings form a lot of parameters, which take up a lot of memory. So if you have a GPU with memory constraints, you're kind of bounded by how large to make this. And remember that um, as you add new words to your vocabulary, you not only add a word embedding, but you also add another entry in your softmax matrix at the end, which is predicting the next word. So um, it's kind of expensive to have a very big vocabulary. Uh, but um, so people just started using like kind of common values uh, are 64K or 32K. Um, you know, if you use 32k merge steps plus your characters, every merge step you get one new entry added, so your vocabulary is going to be roughly 32k word types. Um, yeah, but you can definitely tune this also, right? You can try different sizes of vocabularies and pick the one that seems to work best for whatever task you have. This is very expensive because for every new configuration you have to completely retrain your model and see. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure if there's any like better way to choose this. It's m more or less just a hyperparameter of the modeling. Yeah. That's a good question. So um, uh, you could, for example, in this particular example, uh, tokenize hug using this word type, or you could tokenize it using H-U-G, which is still valid, right? Um, so there are many possible segmentations that could arise as a result of this. Uh, we're in uh, a couple of slides, yeah. So there are other subword encoding schemes um, that people use, which instead of 
merging by a frequency, they merge using some other score, like have a language model and pick the one that reduces the, um, or increases the likelihood of your data as per that language model. And sentence piece in particular is a very popular method that is, is using this language model based approach. It allows you to sample different segmentations at training time. So you're not locked into always using hug uh, or always using HUG. But the traditional approaches will give you a deterministic tokenization given the vocabulary, um, just trying to shorten the sequence as much as possible. But that might not always be good. So um, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. So there are multiple uh, segmentations possible here, right? We're always going to choose the one that minimizes the total sequence length. That's the traditional. So if I have a choice between HUG and uh, the single hug uh, token, I'm going to choose the latter every time. Um, that said, uh, this might not be optimal, and there are other methods that will let you sample a tokenization, but then it becomes hard to evaluate as well because you have to kind of marginalize over all segmentations of some held out sentence to measure its probability. Um, there is actually a question on last semester's midterm specifically about this uh, issue. So probably not going to be another one <laughs> in this year, but uh, you can check that out. All right, so um, let's just review some of the takeaways of this byte pair encoding scheme. First of all, this still allows us to avoid the unknown token problem because uh, if all else fails, we can always break down some unseen sequence into characters. Um, now, I, I do want to talk about, um, because like there's not just you know, 26 letters, right? There's, if you consider all Unicode symbols that could possibly be used, there's 138,000 of these unique symbols. So like a character level model is actually very expensive if you train it using full Unicode, which you might want to because you can express any sort of um, input string in, in these, uh, these symbols. So GPT-2, the, which is OpenAI's transformer language model, this is a decoder only language model as per our terminology, they wanted to um, have all of these Unicode characters, uh, like they wanted their model to be able to output these and handle them in, during uh, training time. So they actually applied this byte pair uh, encoding scheme on top of a byte sequence rather than on top of characters. So Unicode, I think um, it, it represents uh, each character with up to four bytes or eight bytes, I don't remember. Um, but you can always break down each one of these uh, characters into the byte sequence. And you can actually run this BPE algorithm, byte pair encoding on top of the byte sequence. And now you get uh, a subword vocabulary of um, that, that's made on top of the, the bytes, which are determined by the Unicode characters. Yeah. Um, for subword and characterization, do you also Oh, this is a great question. Yes. So what happens because these were we were just talking about words, what happens if your input sequence includes a space? You probably don't want your merges to occur uh, like across a space because that means that now you could have like part of one word and part of another word as one entry in your vocabulary. So generally, and I, I should have mentioned this, when you're applying an algorithm like byte pair encoding, you first do something called pre-tokenization, where you just do white space tokenization, essentially, and then you apply um, the, the algorithm. So every single one of these algorithms, byte pair encoding, word piece, and sentence piece, um, they generally operate by first doing this pre-tokenization step, which involves white space and maybe some other stuff to handle punctuation, and then only doing the uh, byte pair encoding. That's, that's a great question. So sentence piece in particular is interesting because 
it can also do this, uh, this, uh, this algorithm without the pre-tokenization step. And this makes it the only usable um, algorithm for subword tokenization for languages that do not separate words with spaces. So, for example, Thai doesn't, doesn't use spaces, and so you can't, there's no like pre-tokenization step that's easy that you can do there. So sentence piece is the algorithm of choice for multilingual um, language models that have input in many different languages. It's kind of, uh, you, can, you can use it regardless of the, uh, the uh, well, that's, that's not true. I mean, it works better on some languages than others, but at least it still applies more or less. So other algorithms just, uh, just don't at all. Okay, so what are some limitations of the, the kind of subword tokenization? Um, it is also non-concatenative. It has some elements of that which are hard to model. So you can see here um, the root form of this is, uh, I, I guess, right is KTB. He wrote looks like this, and uh, he signed up is like this. So you can see that the root form here is kind of interspersed throughout the sentence. So tokenization in any scheme is kind of very difficult in, in this setup. Um, okay, so like pre-tokenization here, if you wanted to split the words before you uh, run your algorithm is gonna be like impossible in, in this kind of setting. Okay, so in the latter part of this uh, lecture, I wanted to talk about um, Byte T5. It was one of the readings that was on the website, I, I hope. Um, and this is uh, kind of the first tokenizer-free model that has been proposed. It uh, is trained on many, many different languages. Um, so we talked about this colossal crawl data set or whatever was used in uh, the T5 paper when we discussed T5. Um, Byte T5 is trained on MC4, so the multilingual colossal crawl whatever. So they took all of the um, you know web pages on the internet, they did not throw out the non-English ones, but they actually included them, they cleaned them, they deduplicated them, and they have all of this text in many, many different languages. So then all they did in the MT5 model was they, they took their T5 architecture and they just trained it on this MC4 data set. Uh, and they tokenized using sentence piece across the entire data set, which means their vocabulary consists of subwords from English, from uh, many other languages. Uh, the vocabulary is not just one language. It has uh, word pieces from all uh, languages that are observed in the corpus. So it's very interesting. A single model with a single vocabulary is presented with you know, text from 100 different languages and is asked to perform the T5 training objective of like denoising the input. So replacing the sentinel tokens, these X and Y, with the text that goes into those. So MT5 um, is, was their first approach. So these models were trained by Google. MT5 is called multilingual T5. There's really no change from T5 other than the data set. Um, and how it worked was essentially, you might have some sentence in Japan, not sure how to say that, cloison. <laughs> Someone can correct me. <laughs> Enamels are known as uh, shippo yaki, and then there's some characters here in a, um, I, I guess, Japanese. I'm not sure. Does anyone know? Chinese. Okay. Um, so, interestingly, this sentence contains um, words from multiple languages. So, if you look at what happens here in MT5, this sequence, regardless of the fact that it contains these Chinese characters and these English words, it is passed into their sentence piece tokenizer. And the words are replaced with this sequence of subwords. So like these characters here, you can actually even see the tokenization. So in is one word, Japan is one word in the vocabulary. Um, Kloizan becomes three words, so 
clo isan and then the uh, suffix. So all of, and, and you can see these characters here, these are all uh, individual um, subwords as well in the vocabulary. So now, if you look at how they apply the T5 denoising um, corruption to the input, they just, remember, they take 15% of the words in the input and they replace them with these sentinel tokens. So here they've replaced these, uh, these two words here, ne, enem, mels, right? This is crossing across multiple, it's like in the middle of one word and including the word enemels as well. Uh, so it's like the end of this word and the beginning and this full word, all of these are masked, but the beginning of this word is unmasked. So it's kind of strange, right, how, how this is working. Um, and then in the other part, the other sentinel Y, you get this first character here, but these, the rest of the sequence is masked. And so the decoder needs to generate those missing tokens. So in the T5 model, remember, we were applying the masking to like words and subwords in English. We weren't, we were very rarely like doing this where we, uh, you know, mask like the end of one word, the middle of the next word, and so on. But here it's very likely to happen because you have this vocabulary across many different languages and you don't really know the word boundaries and so on. So this is what happened in MT5 and one of the takeaways was that perhaps this tokenization method is not the best for applying it generally to all languages in the world. And maybe there's a better way to do this. So in byte T5, they took this input, they uh, encoded it in Unicode, and then they just converted it to a sequence of bytes that is associated with that input sequence. So now you see that this input sequence is a lot longer than, than this one. In their paper, they say these sequences are on average like four to five times longer than a subword sequence that you would get in MT5. Um, and so uh, now they're masking out like, and, and they have to change their corruption strategy slightly here. So they say they're going to drop like at least five contiguous uh, tokens or something like that. Because now like each token is basically a character almost, or sometimes even four uh, bytes could make up one um, Unicode symbol, right? So you probably want to mask longer sequences here so that you're actually getting some sort of words included in your mask and not just like a single character. Um, but you can see that even still, here they um, mask out this sequence of characters. Here they mask out, I mean, all of these are like this single character is represented with three bytes, I suppose, um, when you convert it from from Unicode. And um, yeah, but you're using the same exact objective function, like predicting the missing spans. The only thing that has changed is the, um, the, the tokenization. So here, we're operating on a sequence of bytes. There's no byte pair encoding at all applied here, which is very interesting. So there is a vocabulary of 256 uh, bytes, and you're just, um, you have a very small vocabulary, but very, very long sequences. This was not possible to try in 2016 or in 2018 even, um, but with the advance of, uh, you know, better hardware and better um, training methods and bigger data sets, we're able to, to do this now. And you can see that in this byte T5 model, comparing it to the other one that I showed, MT5, there are many, many fewer parameters associated with the vocabulary. So remember, in byte T5, I just have 256 embeddings, one for each uh, byte. In MT5, I have a subword vocabulary of probably like 64,000 subwords that's been uh, extracted from this uh, multilingual data set that I have. So if you have a very small T5 architecture of small, right, 300 million parameters, still pretty big, but 85% of those parameters in MT5 are associated with the words in the vocabulary. So the word embeddings and the softmax uh, 
parameters. But in byte T5, there's only 0.3% of the parameters associated with the, the uh, vocabulary because the vocabulary is so small. And you can see that as your model gets bigger and bigger, the number, of, the percentage of parameters that are taken up by the vocabulary grows smaller because more parameters now are devoted to the transformer blocks that are being stacked and the model dimensionality is increasing. So those feed forward layers have a lot more parameters. But um, yeah, I mean, in, in byte T5, the model has way, way more parameters than the vocabulary. Uh, and one thing that they showed with this byte T5 model is that it's much more robust to noise in the inputs. So this could be like spelling errors or typos or dropped characters or uh, caps, uh, capitalization um, uh, choices or whatever. Um, it's much more robust to noise than a subword level model is. And this kind of makes sense, right? Because now you... Uh, if you have like say this some word and you have a corrupted version of that word where you drop one character in the middle with a subword level model that could completely change the tokenization of this word right because now it could be split into three subwords with a dropped character as opposed to just one subword but with byte t5 both of these input sequences look very similar to each other there might just be an absence of one byte in the middle and um, the model thus is much more robust to these kinds of changes. So this was pretty interesting. Um, I think one um, uh, negative of this, which we've already talked about with the character level models, is that when you do something like at the byte level, you have much longer sequences, right? And what is the solution for that? In byte T5, they had no solution. Instead, they were like, well, MT5 is trained on a sequence length of 1,024 subwords. Let's just also train using the exact same sequence length, but we're going to train on 1,024 bytes instead. So in effect, the sequences that they trained on are much shorter. They're like four to five times shorter than the subword level model. Um, and if they wanted to actually compare with the exact same sequence length, they probably would have to use a sequence length of like five or 6,000, which would have made this really, really slow to train even for uh, at Google scale resources. So um, it's still, you know, an open problem how to train these models effectively with very, very long sequence length. If that's solved um, through some architectural advance, then this kind of byte level tokenization will probably become more common um, in the next few years. So at test time, despite having a very, very small vocabulary, byte T5 is uh, seven or even more times slower than MT5 to generate sentences. So why do you think this is? Why might it be slower to generate sentences with this model? Yeah, so remember that to generate a sentence, I have to generate it left to right one token at a time. If I'm generating it in a sequence of bytes, I'm just going to have way more bytes to produce than subwords, right? And you might say, well, all right, but at each time step, I have to do a softmax over the entire vocabulary. With the subword level model, I have, say, 64,000 choices. With the byte level model, I have 256 choices, so maybe it's much faster at each time step to generate a word. Um, but this is not true because at each time step, you have to remember that the model has to go through every single transformer block before getting to the final softmax layer, right? And so that takes up way uh, more of the, the wall clock time compared to the final word prediction step. So you don't actually save all that much. And as the sequences get longer and longer, remember that the model is quadratic in the sequence length. So it gets much, much slower with longer sequences. So um, yeah, practically speaking, this is not really a feasible way of generating or encoding text at the moment. But if you have a problem where 
you're dealing with, say, short sentences and not long documents, and you want a good way of encoding those in, and, and maybe your training data has multiple languages or um, it has different types of noise or, or dialects or something like that, then a model like byte t 5 could be very useful. Um, so in this vein, later in the semester, we'll have a lecture on different uh, transformer variants that um, lower the complexity of the self-attention so that they can be applied to longer and longer sequences. And we'll also talk about some of the issues with, with those uh, models as well. All right, so any questions about the byte T5? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is a great question. So I think it's a question that has been studied quite a bit in machine translation. So I, if I heard correctly, I think your question is, Let's say you have a, a lot of data for one particular, one particular language. Um, could you get away with just training a monolingual model in that language? Or is it always better to use a multilingual model that has information not only from that language, but from many others? Um, I think uh, for a long time, and maybe even now, the state of the art machine translation models were uh, monolingual. So like if you get enough data in one language, it's usually going to be better than uh, a multilingual model because a multilingual could hurt sometimes, right? It could give you biases from other languages that are irrelevant if your goal is to translate into one single language, right? Um, but I think now, uh, like just this year, it could have changed. I don't precisely remember, but there's a lot of progress on multilingual um, translation models, like many to many uh, translation models. So you can translate, put in any language as input and translate to any language as output. Of course, those models are more desirable in general because it's just one model you can put in any sort of uh, input and control the output language. Um, I think it's it's not clear at the moment what what is better, but. For definitely for low resource languages, it's always basically better to use a multilingual model. I, I don't, it might be like there's some threshold after which uh, a monolingual model is better, but I, I'm not actually sure. So the question is, if we are training a model over a data set that consists of multiple languages, shouldn't the tokenization for each language be done differently? So maybe you could learn a separate uh, byte pair encoding vocabulary for each language and apply that to that uh, whenever you see instances of that language. So that's generally not how it's done because language identification is itself hard. And like if you have an instance like this, for example, where you're using multiple languages in the same uh, sequence, it's not really clear. Are you going to switch tokenization when you encounter this? How do you know that this is sufficient to, to switch? And in general, it makes it very complicated because if you have just a unified single tokenization, single vocabulary, then you don't really need to know what language is currently being um, fed into your model, right? You're always applying the same uh, tokenization rules to it. Uh, I think with enough data, you will, even with a single vocabulary, um, you will see enough uh, from each language to have like uh, some part of the vocabulary consist of reasonable subwords for that language that are used. I'm pretty sure that's what's happening in MT5, but of course, this also shows some of the limitations of that, that approach. With the byte level uh, model, of course, this is not an issue because you're not doing any sort of merging or anything like that. Okay, other questions? All right, so let's get to, I just, I think I have two slides left, so we might end early. Um, there's another line of work that has become popular in uh, the last year or so which is on learnable tokenization. So 
all of this stuff that we've talked about to this point has been about you have a fixed method for coming up with the segmentation, right? Either you um, do this byte pair encoding thing that's done before the model is trained, right? So you, you get your vocabulary, you tokenize it, and only then do you feed it into your model. Um, so I could do this at the word level, the subword level, the character level, the, uh, with whatever algorithm I want. But at the end of the day, this is a fixed pre-processing step. After I do this, I'm going to train my model. One of the insights behind some of the more recent papers is that it's not really clear that any one of these tokenizations is better than the other. What if we allowed the model to learn what kind of segmentation is best for the task that it's trying to solve? So this charformer paper, you can see, includes the tokenization step as part of the training process. So even this tokenizer is backpropped into, which is pretty interesting. So normally, if you look at the, the figure on the left, in a subword model, you get the input sequence, and then you apply something like BPE or sentence piece or whatever, and then you get the subword token sequence, and then you pass that into your model, and the only things that are learned are part of your transformer model. In the charformer, um, the tokenizer itself is also learned. So let's take a look at how this works. So given the input sequence charformer, like this character sequence, C-H-A-R-F-O-R-M-E-R, that's the name of the model, um, they consider these four different tokenizations where first you have just uh, characters associated with the sequence or bytes, I suppose, in their case. Um, and then you consider all pairs of characters, so like C-H, uh, A-R, F-O, R-M. Then you consider all blocks of three characters, all blocks of four characters. So um, you're not actually doing any sort of subword or anything like this during this uh, formation of the blocks. These are just non-overlapping blocks of uh, contiguous segments of length k characters. And now, to represent uh, a single character in this, um, in this input, I'm going to use all of these different um, representations from each of these uh, block level tokenizations. So let's say I'm interested in the letter O. I have the character embedding for O, and then I also have O as part of this two block chunk FO. O is part of the three block chunk RFO, and it's part of this four block chunk FORM. So if you assume you have a vector, a, whoops, uh, I don't know what I did there. If you assume you have a vector associated with each of these blocks, you can imagine that to get the final representation of O, you can actually do some sort of attention over these four vectors that are associated with each different segmentation of this word. And so you assign some score to each of these blocks, and you take the weighted average of all of the vectors to get a final vector for O. So C-H-A-R-F-O-R-M-E-R, -E all of these will get represented with a single vector, but that vector is a combination, a linear combination of um, these different possible ways to represent that letter in context. So it could be just the letter itself, it could be the letter within this four word block and so on. And so this is kind of a limited approach at the moment, right? Because you have to define this block level encoding scheme, which is super simple here. But you could imagine making this more complicated, maybe integrating something like byte level, character, subword, and word level tokenization in as blocks instead of these contiguous characters, and then uh, applying this learned tokenization over it to, um, because maybe some characters you might want to use just the character level representation, other ones you might benefit more from including more context around, um, so you can get the benefits of all of these tokenizations in, in one model. That's the general idea. Um, okay, so hopefully at the end of this lecture you've learned, um, you know, that tokenization is itself an incredibly complicated topic. You could use many different tokenizations 
Um, most of the pre-trained models that you'll be using in Hugging Face for your projects or homeworks use subword level tokenization, um, either with the uh, vanilla byte pair encoding or with sentence piece. Um, so you should at least understand how to you know, go through this whole subword encoding process. But it probably in the future we'll see more models that are using byte or learnable tokenization like these last few uh, slides have shown. All right, any final questions? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the, it, well, it's very unclear what the score to represent. I don't think there has been any analysis in this kind of setup of which blocks are getting more score in which context and so on. That would be very useful to do. Um, this work is very new, so I think there will probably be a lot of stuff building on this um, and analyzing it in the future. But yeah, like, you can interpret the attention weight. I think they just say it's like some scoring function, but the higher the score, the more it contributes to the representation at that position. Are you talking about this? Uh, Uh-huh. Oh, I see. So like this approach applied to Chinese, how would you do that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure because they're like you have characters, right? Um, which is not the same as in, in this case. Uh I'm not sure. It probably cannot be just blindly applied to, to that language. I mean, you, you could do this, but you would, your blocks would then be spanning like many words, right? So um, I, I don't know. They, they only tried in English as far as I know. Okay, other questions? Do you have one? Oh, I see. So, is this a solution to like a long sequence problem? Yeah. So, I guess your question is, if you have a very long sequence, could you apply some sort of simple pooling operation to chunks of that sequence to make it shorter and then apply a transformer over those representations? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a, a maybe not widely used technique, but it's definitely a technique that people have tried before. You can look at uh, the compressive transformer as one instance of this. There's also um, something called a sentence level language model where you just split up your input into sentences, represent each one of those by like a BERT CLS token, and then run a um, language model on top of those. Um, yeah, but most of the work in the efficient transformer space actually does have the entire input as part of the input sequence without this kind of compression and focuses on the self-attention and making that uh, faster or sparser or something like that. All right, um, so you can look out for homework one coming out later this week and uh, see you next uh, Monday.